Hi, good morning. Uh, well, it's, it's wonderful to be here today uh, uh, with such a fantastic topic about uh, innovation all around us. And there's been a lot of theory this morning, the theory of innovation and the theory about how, um, how companies need to change. Uh, I'll maybe take you through this morning uh, some of the things we've been doing at DBS and really taking a lot of these ideas and using that to completely rebuild the company from the ground up. Um, and we were recently awarded, in fact, two years out of three, the world's best digital bank. So, um, you know, while I don't think we're necessarily the best, certainly some of the ideas that we have uh, are starting to uh, make some impact uh, and, and be seen and recognized globally. Uh, but before we get into the presentation, uh, I obviously need to answer one burning question, which must be in all of your, your minds, is uh, am I uh, a, a Trekkie or, or a Star Wars fan? And uh, the answer is uh, both. I'll, I'll sit and watch both until the cows come home. Um, but actually, the, the modern version of that, because uh, obviously you have to sort of change with the times, uh, is now I've become a huge fan of the Orville. And for those of you who watched it, I'm sure you'll know what I mean. For those who haven't, go check it out. It's, uh, it's uh, what happens when one of the most famous cartoonists in the world gets hold of a theme and, and revolutionizes it. Anyway, uh, we're not here to talk about Trekkie. We're here to talk about banking. And um, yeah, let me start with this, uh, this thing that, because ev everybody says, right, the world is changing around is very obvious, but let me talk it in the DBS context. And the DBS context of this uh, starts out with what we're traditionally trying to do as an organization and a bank, uh, which is to, um, to grow uh, organically. Typically, we add branches, uh, and adding branches gets you more customers, uh, or you grow in inorganically and you take over another uh, bank, and then you kind of integrate that. Um, we tried both of those models from about 2009 to 2014, uh, and quite frankly, had simply failed to grow at the size and scale that we wanted to using those traditional methods. At the same time, we saw the Alibaba's and Tencent's time, uh, creating Alipay and all of the technology, and we saw a bunch of fintech startups starting to nibble away at certain banking products uh, and services. And so, at that point, around about 2014, you know, we said, "Okay, the traditional model." Uh, is clearly dead. We, uh, you know, we're dominant in Singapore, but it's very, very hard to grow outside of that. What if we took the lessons of the, the tech platform giants and the fintechs and started to rethink this organic model of growing to growing through technology? And that's the journey we've been on, but it really didn't start back in 2014. Um, going back to uh, 2009, we had this whole model about how to really grab innovation technology and push it down through the organization. The first is that we were going to be uh, digital to the core. So we weren't going to create like digital lipstick on the side. We were going to think about how do you really completely uh, restructure and rebuild the bank right down to the core of the operational aspects of the company. Uh, the second is to stop thinking about transactions and really embrace journey thinking. And I'll talk about the scale with which we've done that. Uh, and the third is that we weren't going to create some little startup uh, or disrupt a bank on the side. We were going to take everybody with us along the journey. Uh, and so we saw ourselves as how do you create a 26,000 person startup so everybody is innovating at the same space in the company. Um, looking at digital to the core, back in 2009, we had some basics to fix. So the first four or five years of my tenure as CIO, and I've been CIO since uh, 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 late 2008, early 2009, uh, is we had to kind of fix the plumbing of the place. And we drew this very simple chart way back in 2009, uh, which gave a very simple map about where we were in the state of our technology at DBS. And we used a very simple color scheme of uh, red, blue, and green. And red is sell, we hate it, we gotta sell it. Uh, green is buy, we wanna do more on that platform, blue is hold. And the reason we use that is that even traders could understand that diagram. And so it became a communication mechanism. You know, normally architecture diagrams have lines on them and all sorts of like nonsense. This is very simple, buy, sell, hold. And we did it by location and key banking function. And we used this as a map to say, a lot of work to do. Let's prioritize it. Let's think about the business priorities. How do we build this out? Uh, we had six different core bank, six, seven different core banking systems. We had 12 different loan systems. Just, just horrible. By 2014, we'd move to this. And so we'd replace core banking in virtually every market. Uh, we'd rebuilt payment systems. We put new front ends on. We got new information systems. 
And to be honest, this, this is dynamic. So this is the picture at 2014. Of course, things evolve, and if you kind of remark this today, there's a whole lot of things that would be, be sell again. You know, the key point here is that technology keeps moving and iterating, but by 2014, we were confident we had a very, very strong platform on which we could accelerate a digital transformation. But then what next? Uh, well, we knew that um, as we started to think about we want to enter and drive a technology-driven bank, uh, how do you how do you do that? And how do you increase velocity? How do you leverage new technologies? A lot of the things that were talked about uh, this morning. And so what we did is we went very, very deep. We went very deep to understand if we want to become more like a technology company, let's go look at those technology companies, figure out how they operate, and bring the DNA of that back into DBS. So we looked very, very closely at how uh, uh, Google Instrument, uh, how, uh, uh, how Amazon Scale, uh, how Netflix do instrumentation and uh, uh, all of the data analytics, Apple, LinkedIn, Facebook, the Ganalf uh, companies. And we said, uh, okay, we need to be more like them. And, and actually, if you look at that, um, for those Lord of the Rings fans, you'll see that spells uh, Ganalf. Um, it's missing a D. <laughs> and fortunately, <laughs> we just happen to have a D. So our goal was how do we become the D in Gandalf? Now, this might seem a little cheesy, uh, but in actual fact, this was drove a revolutionary change in people's thinking at DBS about who we are, about who we aspire to be, about how we build technology, about how we move fast. And so Gandalf became the rallying cause for thousands of people in the company. And it also set the technologies free, because what it said to people is, don't worry about how we did things in the past, and don't try and justify whether that was right or wrong. Things are different. And moving forwards, we need to build like the Gandalf companies, and that's our goal, and we'll change and shift to do that. But that's just a, a, a catchphrase. Underneath that, we, we saw five key things that had to shift. One is that we had to shift from all these many projects with steering committees and budget approval process to running platforms, which is what all these companies do. They're on a platform, you fund the platform, you then have people focus on, on outcomes. That enables you to do agile at scale. Uh, but with that, you have to completely rethink about the organization, biz tech, tech ops, how you drive KPIs, et cetera, through the business. So there's a lot of social re-engineering you do to make yourself uh, be able to move at speed. Um, and, and then third and fourth, uh, sorry, fourth and fifth is that designing for modern systems, so design for instrumentation, for scalability, uh, for uh, resilience, et cetera, et cetera. And the last but very key piece is automate everything. That to automate the entire delivery pipeline uh, through from testing to deploy to, to uh, instrumenting restarts, et cetera. All of those things are the deliverables which achieves, uh, achieves or moves you more towards being a Gandalf-like company. We had some outcome uh, goals as well. So what does all this achieve? Well, we wanted to be cloud native. Uh, we saw a massive reduction in cost, increase in resilience, scalability, time to market. Uh, we want to increase cadence, so the speed with which we put software, our banks are typically slow. Our goal was to increase cadence by 10 times. We also saw ourselves, if we want to be a, think ourselves more of a platform company, uh, we need to be able to uh, expose APIs so that others can build on us and become an API company built for APIs and performance. And the last thing underpinning all of this is an investment in people and skills. And this is probably the most important thing that we did. We said, if we're going to be a tech company, we need to own, build, and design, and run all of our own technology. When I first joined DBS in 2000, uh, end of 2008, we were 85% outsourced. We were run by vendors. Uh, these large vendors, we had managed service contracts. And actually, the technology people inside DBS were merely signing contracts and managing service levels with the vendor. We had no technology DNA. By the end of last year, we were 90% insourced, self-managed, self-run, not dependent on vendors. And so we'd rebuilt all of our technology DNA. And today, we design, run, build, operate all of our own technology. We still have a few partners uh, for various platforms, but basically, we've completely flipped to become an engineering-led company uh, with all the technologies working for DBS. Uh, cloud native uh, was our other big push. Now, 
everybody has a cloud strategy, uh, but they're not all the same. And we see a lot of cloud lipstick out there. A lot of lift and shift, and yes, we're in the cloud, but you'll find that one of their systems is, and there's some experiment, etc. Uh, we said, how do we do cloud to the core? And the, the big lesson from the Gandalf companies is around really re-engineering to be cloud right through to the core. With that, that means changing people, software, and hardware. So you can't just lift and shift and have the same people. Our costs typically run for running systems about the third hardware, third software, third people. Uh, typical cloud migrations we've seen maybe save you 20%, but by re-engineering, taking out all of the very expensive software in the middle, really, really focusing on automation, uh, can get you from a very sort of traditional uh, proprietary uh, stack um, down to about 20% of the cost. How far are we on that journey? Well, we're very far along. Uh, we're very far along. We're about 80% uh, done in moving to what I would say uh, cloud ready or cloud optimized. Uh, that's not cloud native. So if you were to sort of say, okay, pure microservice, uh, containerized workloads, mm, probably about 10 or 15%. But the thing is that we've, we figured this trick of how you re-engineer enough out of the rest of the systems uh, to make them, uh, the economics of that uh, and the scalability of that look much more like cloud. And we build that on our own internal uh, hybrid cloud, cloud mainly. What that's done is massively reduced uh, the server footprint. And this is a real sort of measure of, uh, of how successful uh, you can be with this. So we've, we've reduced about 86% of our non-strategic hardware now. Uh, we've moved that uh, predominantly to our virtual private cloud. And, and 80 oh 93% of our workload uh, runs on uh, just 10% of the hardware compared to where we used to be. It's a massive, massive reduction of footprint and cost and everything that goes alongside with that. What that's enabled us to do is really shift our uh, operating cost ratios. So uh, if you look at the operate, which is uh, the red, it's the stuff that's expensive and you want to reduce that, we've reduced that. And in fact, it's come down by 40% uh, as, a, as a percent of income. That's a massive reduction. But what we've done is we've actually kept all of our technology spend flat 2014 to 2018. We didn't increase technology spend at all. Uh, and we exited 2018 about the same spend of 2014. But what we did is use all of those saves from the operate and plowed that back, in build, uh, back into uh, uh, building. And most of the build that we did, because in the early years we'd focused on the core, most of this is the front end build that we're now getting. So our, our, our speed and our delivery cadence increased rapidly uh, by really driving Gandalf through the organization. Uh, what about cadence? Well, uh, we took a lesson from uh, Jeff. Uh, you know, everybody's heard about the two pizza teams and uh, 1.6 seconds between releases. And really, uh, you know, that's all about this. This is really what they're after. And they say that uh, when you're doing requirements and the typical way of building systems, you learn some learnings, but you really re learn when you release. And because we're really rethinking about banking and rethinking about coming up with completely new products, we have no clue how they're going to work when we deploy to market. And so our ability to release quickly and learn fast and iterate, hugely important. To achieve that, again, that automate everything thing that I talked about, uh, we moved 100% of our applications to an automated deploy pipeline. We increased test automation by about 10%. There's much more we can do on this. The overall result of that, which is speed, how quick and how many times a month do we push things to uh, dev, prod, et cetera, increased 8.5 times over that period. That is a massive competitive advantage to be able to do that. What about APIs and performance? Well, we see actually ourselves as uh, a participant in an ecosystem of jobs to be done for our customers. So we see ourselves not as just the banking in the middle, but how do we, s how do we support all of these um, uh, life events uh, around the periphery? And they can be short term and they can be long term. We can't build all of that uh, outer circle. It's just simply not possible. But what we can do is create APIs so that others can build on us, and we become a platform that helps others provide those services to customers. So uh, a few years ago, we decided to really go heavy on APIs, uh, and we launched our platform a couple of years ago now, 
Um, we currently have over 350 live APIs that are real and are, and are running. Uh, we have 90 live partners uh, so far, and we think we're going to take that live partners uh, up to north of 1,000 in, uh, in the next 18 months or so. So really scale up and become an ecosystem play, not a traditional bank. What about journey thinking? Well, everybody talks about that as well. Um, you know, we are our, our first big uh, uh, journey thinking program was to think about what a, what a purely digital bank would look like. Uh, in India, we'd had a, a problem growing uh, by branching out. And so we said, can we do it with a, a, a mobile-only bank? And what would that look like? And what's the journeys involved in creating such a product? Again, we had no idea. Our goal was open an account in 90 seconds without visiting a branch and have full banking capabilities available to you uh, uh, once you've done a very simple identification. Behind that, we had some goals. And our goals were that we wanted to actually create a purely digital experience supported digitally. So how could you run this thing with only 10% of the staff it would take to run a typical bank? Uh, we're actually at about 20% now, but we kind of have an engineering plan to get the rest out. But super, super efficient and scalable. So how do you, how do you, but how do you acquire customers without branches? Because typically you have to go in and identify yourself uh, at a branch to open a full account. So what we did is we said, well, um, okay, we can leverage off this brilliant ecosystem in India uh, called the Adhar card. And the Adhar card comes with a biometric thumbprint. And, um, you know, in Singapore, you use that to clear customs, but that's all you can do with it. India made this brilliant decision to open that up as an API. So KYC and authentication as a service. So all you needed was a thumbprint and somebody to present an ID. You put the thumbprint down and Adhar will authenticate that this person is actually registered to this card and the address and everything match up. That's all we need to do. So we don't need branches, but we need thumbs. So how do you, so the, the challenge became, we have a thumb acquisition challenge. And so what we did is we said, well, we partnered with the India equivalent of Starbucks, Cappy Coffee Day. And we used our APIs to integrate right into their point of sale terminal and the back end to Adhar. And we gave each one of these outlets a little thumb reader. And so now you can go to Cappy Coffee Day and order a cappuccino, an Americano, or a DBS bank account. And all of a sudden, we have 650 points of presence for customer acquisition at zero incremental cost. It's full of um, fintech. So uh, we run a chatbot at the front end. In fact, we don't publish a call center number. You can eventually speak to somebody, but 80% of the chats are handled by a, a chatbot at the front. That's a fintech startup out, out of the US. And now we're doing AI cross-sell and, and lending, et cetera, again, run by fintech. So the point about this is you think about what I said at the start of DBS to stop thinking about how we grow as a traditional bank, but how do we become an ecosystem play and how do we leverage fintechs? That's exactly what Digibank is. It leverages the ecosystem of a coffee chain in this case uh, and, and the a uh, Adar API system. And it also uses a bunch of fintechs at the back end. So we've become an integrator of fintech and uh, ecosystems to create something like Digibank. So we, we said, well, can we lift and shift that to uh, India, uh, to Indonesia? So where India is the land of coffee, and we can do it through these uh, baristas, uh, in Indonesia, you have to have kind of quasi-employees that actually do this authentication. So you need to take a little device around to someone's home or have them come to you. But we don't want them to come to us, and we don't have branches. So what do we do there? Well, in Indonesia, it's the land of delivery. And there are hundreds of thousands of Grab and Gojek riders delivering everything from people to washing to laundry to massage service to car washing. So we took a look at that and said, hmm, okay, maybe this guy is actually the next fintech. And maybe that his little backpack could be a bank branch and the teller. And so what we do in Indonesia is, again, we plug our APIs into, into uh, a system which then they can use to go authenticate customers. And while it might seem crazy in a market like Singapore that you would deliver a bank account on a two-wheeler, in Indonesia, because it's normal to have everything delivered on a two-wheeler, a bank account is no biggie. And it's a super, super cost, low cost of distribution. 
So um, all of this stuff needs to get uh, back, though, by some really, really super service and this whole customer-centered thinking. And so underneath and underlying all of this uh, is uh, Tibco right in the middle. We use a, a lot of their messaging capability. Um, but we also design it through our cloud um, uh, things to scale 10, how do we increase scale 10 times? And we still need to get rid of some of the legacy components to achieve that, but that's our goal is that you can, you can expand and collapse this thing 10 times with, with not much uh, uh, work. Uh, and how do we perform not at the average, but the 99th percentile. So how do we get the experience that is in a customer's hand so at the 99th worst, uh, uh, worst performance, it's still operating superbly well? That takes a great deal of really, really smart engineering to achieve that. Um, and so, you know, moving on, third, third thing is how do you create a 26,000-person uh, startup? Well, I've talked about customer obsession. We believe in being data-driven. Uh, a big, a big uh, part of this morning was around data about taking risk and experiment, being agile and learning organization. So let me talk about data-driven, uh, first of all. And let me talk about it in the context of not just, you know, um, everybody is an individual and a targeted offers, but let me talk about it in terms of, you know, the instrumentation that we put in place to make sure that we offer this amazing service uh, all the time. And it leads me on to this uh, discipline that we call customer science, which is if you think about a control tower for customers and about the DBS landscape, what would that control tower for DBS look like? Uh, looking at customers, et cetera, et cetera. And so we built this uh, operating uh, customer science operation center that really looks at journey flows, breakage points, performance, to optimize everything about how we interact with our customer. So one of the things that we use, for example, is this, which is actually a, a, di a, a, a live movement of people through our various sites. So they're logging in the middle, then they move to our uh, internet banking or mobile banking, and then migrate between. And what are we looking for here? We're looking for drop-offs. Where are they pausing? Uh, is there any difficulty or struggle? Did they try and complete something and didn't? And we can use this to design and optimize the way that our experience manifests to the customers. But we also need to, at the back end, instrument all of our services. So this is uh, our service bus. And what we're looking at here is all of the interactions that make that customer experience real. Uh, this is Visceral, which is a, a Netflix uh, open source project. And here, the little dots represent uh, 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 performance. So we're looking at the yellow dots are where we're starting to see performance lag at the 99th percentile, and the red dots are where we see it out of bounds. So we can start to actually play around with this and using uh, chaos engineering from Netflix, we can start to destroy and slow down various aspects of this, um, uh, this back-end system to see where the vulnerabilities and fails are and how we can be more recoverable and more performant to our customers. So a huge amount of data science and engineering going to the back end to make the front end look absolutely superb. Uh, take risk and experiment. Um, you know, we, we ran 1,000 experiments uh, last year. We have 15,000 15, people engaged in various innovation programs. So we have an innovation team that creates innovators but does not innovate itself. Uh, agile, we use Agile everywhere, but Agile uh, is, is, is also about being creative and about testing and learning new ideas. So, uh, I'll, you know, one idea was recruiting. Uh, with all of these technologies we had to bring in, how do we hire and recruit the best technologists in the modern world that understand the modern stack? And so we said, well, you know, the old-fashioned way of, in uh, of, of interviewing, it just takes too long. And how do you find people? How do you attract people to us? So we came up with this notion of DBS hack to hire. Um, and, and what it is is that we, uh, we, we run a, uh, an event. We invite people to come. And when they, when they come to our site, they do a, a coding test. And the people who score highest on the coding test, we bring them in to hack with us for a weekend. Now, typically, the prizes for a hackathon or a iPad or a drone or whatever, the prize for our hackathon is a job at DBS. So they leave on the Sunday with a job offer in their hands. The first time we ran this, and we run it with um, you know, cloud providers and modern stack organizations, we had 12,000 applicants. Uh, and we had then several hundred people come in to do the hack. And we think by end of this year, we'll be close to hiring 1,000 people through this route. 
And this was a whole idea of, you know, we, we had no idea this was going to work, but it sounded like a fun idea to test and learn. So really this idea of innovation and agile and test and learn doesn't just apply to building systems, it applies to how the bank operates. Being a learning organization, some things we learned from LinkedIn and Google and a couple of others was this how everybody continually learns and we teach and learn each other. Uh, so one of the examples of this is a program we, we run called Back to School. And this is where we have technologists teaching business about technology and business teaching technologists about business. Everybody's got something to share and learn. Uh, and the last time we ran this, we had 8,500 participants come, a massively successful event. The whole point of this is this dri is driving a culture that we're all learning all the time. And teaching each other and being participatory in learning is how we want to achieve that. So a lot of those things are what helped DBS go from, um, uh, from a, what I would say an average bank uh, to a bank that last year won two of the biggest uh, global awards uh, in finance. We won world's best bank from global finance, uh, which is a US publication, and from the banker, which is a Financial Times publication. And that is what is about being the D in Gandalf. Thank you very much.